everybody. Welcome to the first episode of Design Recharge for the new year. It's episode 325. I love 25, so I don't know why. Probably because I was born on the 25th. Um, <laughs> I always say it's uh, my husband had a hard time knowing when my birthday was. He told the people on Allstate or wherever we had our insurance when we first got married, they were like, well, we need to confirm that it's you. Could you please tell us your birthday? And I was like, April 25th. And he's, my, the lady's like, I'm sorry, we're not going to be able to talk to you about this. And I'm like, what? And they were like, that's not the date your husband gave. I'm like, oh okay, gosh. well, we will be talking about that later. I was like, look, it's four months after Jesus. It's a quarter, four, a quarter, four quarters makes a dollar. There's a lot of easy ways to remember that. But this month, I'm really excited. It's all about mental health and Tara and I have been friends for a while. I've asked her to be on the show and we've just crossed paths and we hadn't been able to do it. So I'm so, so excited to have her on. She's super passionate about people. She's super passionate about mental health and people getting what they need and being able to talk about it. And she's always really inspired me. She's an amazing designer, illustrator, artist, and she lives in Canada. She's a obviously a surfer on the wall you see her surfboard <laughs> but she's also a snowboarder which I love snowboarding too so I'm real excited I'm excited to have everybody here Josh Gooch from uh, outside of Charlotte some little town that I can't ever remember Michael Fonville <laughs> from Houston hey Paul my new friend from Minnesota that we're gonna talk and then um, Taylor Ackerman she's in Illinois I always want to say she's awesome. in Indi Indiana but she's not she was the volunteer of the year last year at Creative South and Will. So we've got the whole, the whole slew of people. So I'm excited. And we have David Woods, who's new. So I'm glad to have you. So Tara, this Tara Victoria, I want you to give them a little bit of your background and then we're going to jump right in. Sure. Yeah. So as you said, um, I'm a designer, illustrator, and artist. Um, I've been working for myself now um, for since 2015. Um, with a little stint in Atlanta, still kind of working for myself as well. Um, so yeah, I'm from Calgary, Alberta, Canada, born and raised. And um, I specialize in branding and branded illustration. And I'm currently in the process of kind of shifting my career a little bit into more into art. So I've got some exciting things coming up on that. And then I also have an uh, community that I'm in the process of building um, called You Are the Wolf that is around um, healing and heartbreak and abuse and trauma and all of those things um, that we all go through and really building community and conversation around them. Because it's so important that yeah. we can support each other because you feel really alone when you're in the middle of something like that. And we go through different t t times of our life. Sometimes it's something that happened to us young. Sometimes it's something that happens. It can even happen with a client. I've had, mm -hmm. I think I've had clients that have been abusive to, uh, totally. to some oh, yeah. degree. And there's different l kinds of abuse as well. There's yeah. mental, there's emotional, there's physical. And so one of the things with this group, you're not a psychologist, but you know, no. because you <laughs> have had experience with this and i have too that um just with depression anxiety with any kind of somebody taking advantage of you or you being nice and somebody taking um to an extreme right they're they're really adjusting the way you live or the way you work around them and we're gonna talk about why meeting in a group and finding a people who actually can hear you and a safe place to be able to share is really important and it's really helped you. Can you kind of dig into that a little bit and then I'll go into some other questions? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I have always been very open and honest about my anxiety and depression because from I was diagnosed when I was 13, but I know I can remember from an earlier age having dealt with it. I just didn't know what it was. I didn't know how to articulate it. And I made a decision in high school just to be really open about it because I, I refused to let it define me and I refused to see it as a bad thing because for some reason I just accepted that it's the way I'm wired. And obviously I have times where I feel like a burden or I feel like I'm too much or anything like that, but I just decided to be really open about it. And I found more often than not, I would continuously have these conversations with people 
because I would kind of go first and have like just kind of open up about how I was feeling and the things that I struggle with. And then we would have these like, I thought I was the only one who dealt with this moment. And I just realized like, why is no one talking about this? And especially in the creative community, because it's such a, it's more, I feel like it's more prominent in the creative community for people to deal with these kinds of things, just most likely in the way we're wired kind of thing. Um, and so I just saw the power in being vulnerable and being open about these things. And so and you had um, to be bold and maybe it was because you accepted that so early on yeah. that you didn't fear that rejection. You just accepted yourself for who that you were this way. And it, maybe it was just that you are loved. Your brothers loved you. Your parents loved you that, that you felt like you could share that and your friends loved you. And it wasn't, you didn't have a lot of bad um, experiences sharing that. Actually, it was very um, connecting for you as a yeah. very right. And I think that a lot of people, and I think maybe it's harder a little bit for men. We'll ask Lenny next week, for sure. but I think that it is difficult, more yeah. difficult. I would agree with that. Um, yeah. I mean, I did have the odd experience. I I've had experiences where, you know, I'm too much for people or whatever the case, but, um, and yeah, sometimes that affects me and brings me down and is really hard to handle. Um, but those connection experiences kind of outweighed them. Um, and then, uh, for two years, I was in an extremely abusive relationship. Um, it was psychological, emotional, and physical abuse. And um, that was really difficult. And during those two years, I was very isolated and no one knew what was going on in terms of the abuse. And I didn't know what was going on in terms of the abuse either. And so coming out of that, I decided to not be quiet about it. And something that my therapist told me as I was getting out of it was, um, she said, your story is not unique, like, unfortunately. And that sounds so upsetting. And it is upsetting to know that other people go through that. But it also gave me a little bit of comfort and strength in knowing that there are people out there who have gone through the same thing or similar things. Um, obviously the timelines are different, the experience is different, but the story is not unique. And so when I moved back home, I just decided to be really open with what had happened um, and kind of took the same mentality as I did with my mental health. I wasn't going to allow these things to define me. I wasn't going to allow myself to be defined as a victim or anything. I was a survivor. Um, and it took me a really long time to actually get to a place where I felt proud of leaving because for a really long time, um, you know, people would tell me that and I would say, no, I shouldn't have been there in the first place or like, it, there's a lot of shame associated with it. Um, but when I got to a place where I felt proud and realized how strong um, I uh, was able to open up to people and um, build that community and the same thing started happening where I would share my um, experience and my story and people would go, I've been through something really similar. But it's really hard for a lot of people to be that first, yeah, that bold person that shares that in the beginning. Because it's not like you're in a first conversation like, hi, I'm Tara. You know, it, yeah. this is, but one of the things that you're good at is one on one conversations and being real and, mm -hmm. and being authentic. And I think that it shows in your work, like you can get to a place in your work. Your work is so powerful. You can do super fun. You can do super deep. You can do, I mean, your work is, you have a really amazing ability. But I also think that that must Thank help you. with your clients as well because you can kind of cut past some of that. Um, uh, the shallow water. Totally. Right? Yeah. And like, that's something that I do in branding with when I do the discovery, because I've always been very interested in why we do what we do. And so I built that into my branding process because if I'm just making pretty pictures, then it's not going to resonate with anyone. And so I try to dive deep into 
really in like anything that I do, I love having deep conversations and getting vulnerable. And even when it comes to business, like, why are you doing this? Why are you building this thing? Why are you rebranding it? Why are you, you know, those kinds of things um, so that I can visually communicate the right thing. Right. So, <clears throat> so often creatives are, we deal with self-doubt. So I know that that has to come in. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> in, into play. And uh, we have, me and you have talked about our debilitating self talk, right? And something you and I both are working on. How is being intentional about sharing your vulnerabilities with multiple people, new people within a safe community changed your life, do you think? Um, I feel like having those, um, like I thought I was the only one moments and being able to relate to people really helped because it just allows you to not feel alone and it allows you to realize like, Hey, I'm not the only one who, who deals with these kinds of things. And when you're a creative and you deal with anxiety and depression or you're in an abusive relationship, isolation is the worst thing but it happens so easily, especially with anxiety, because, you know, some of the negative self-talk that can happen is I'm too much. I'm a burden. People don't want to be around me because I'm always down. They don't know how to relate to me or they won't understand or whatever. So I'll just deal with this by myself and close myself off. And then it creates a, just a downward spiral. Um, because if we don't talk about our hurt and our pain and our trauma and, and these things, then we feel alone in it. And then it just creates more hurt and then we just spiral. So, so how does somebody get out of that spiral? So, um, maybe not necessarily your situation, but how have you seen with other people or how would you, we'll get into how, if we have a friend who's in that, but how can somebody yeah. kind of like, because it's really like um the the paddles kind of to you that you have to to step out and get out it's not really like you can ease away right like when i've had that with a client it's like i have to cut the ties totally but how do you get to that point like what what stories have you heard that have resonated with a lot of people that what was that point that they got to that made them realize was it just self-reflection or was it tired of being alone or I think it honestly is different for everyone and it's a combination of things I know um for some people it just they have to hit rock bottom to reach out asking for help is one of the hardest things and takes so much strength and so much courage and I think it's it's maybe for some it's reaching rock bottom and going like i i can't do this by myself um reaching out whether that's a friend that they can trust a therapist a family member um those kinds of things it can also be you know having people check on you having those people that they maybe don't know what's going on because you won't open up to them but they're constantly checking on you. And then you reach a point where you're like, you know what, I got to let these walls down because I can't do this by myself. And I think it really can be different for everyone. But I think a lot of times it, it comes with a rock bottom. So that you are the, you are the wolf. The, one of the important things is that it can be a place where it could be that first um, safe place to go to say, this is what I'm thinking. Is this, what I'm going through kind of is that what you're envisioning what would you because I know right now we can just sign up and I'm going to put the yeah. link in and it'll also be down below um but what's the what's the purpose of the you are the wolf the the main goal for me is to raise awareness about these issues and so that it might not be a conversation with me because I can't really facilitate that right but the whole point is for it to be shed light on these issues and shed light on the things that so many people feel on their own and these stories and triumphs and, and heartache and all of these things so that they feel comfortable enough to go to those places of people that they can trust and find community within their, like within their realm. Because the other thing is like remote communities are great. They're wonderful. I mean, I have, so many of them but it's 
another thing to look someone in the face, in the eye, one-on-one, and be able to have those kinds of conversations or cry or get a hug or, you know, it's a completely different thing. And that's what I want to promote and to really drive home that like you can find those communities and those people that you trust in your own home. It just takes time and it just, it unfortunately takes work. And sometimes you don't find those people until you're 30, but you will. And you're not alone. And there are those people. You just have to be willing to open up. You have to be willing to be vulnerable. And it takes a lot of courage, which you may be in a place where you feel like, I don't even have that ounce of courage because I've been told I'm worthless or I'm worthless without this person or worthless without this client or whatever it is. But yeah. but um, mental health is something that um, I think, you know, everybody has a kind of a level state maybe, but then some people go really high and then some people yeah. go really low. And I think sometimes the middle state, um, it, it sort of, I remember in the, when I was really low, it felt like the middle state was just like numbness, yeah, right? Totally. But now as I'm 46, I feel like the middle, I have highs. I think I have more highs than lows, but I definitely I think if I have a low, um, I, I do try to reach out. I try to have somebody that knows me, loves me, and listens to me. And I think that's changed over the years. I have different people that um, can really, I can call on. And I think sometimes, and I think we're going to get into this a little bit, um, because I think that uh, for me, I, I believe that God is right there with me. And sometimes I feel like I try to call my mom or I try to call my, (laughs) my friend Tara, whose name is actually T E R R A, or I try (laughs) to call somebody else, you know, and nobody picks up. My mom always picks up. Like, I don't know where my mom is if she's not picking up the phone, but I always feel like that's like a message straight from God saying, Hey, talk to me, Diane, you don't need. So, but that's another part of the, for something that's helped you is some of a spiritual connection. And I, we haven't ever really talked about that, but I know that there are some people who are going to find that there is a spiritual mental health as well. Totally. Yes. (laughs) So what would you say a tip would be for somebody who sees a friend who is uh, disconnecting more? What would you do? in that situation? So, um, a lot of times you, you can't force someone to talk to you, right? You can't force someone to tell you what's going on. Um, so an example would be like when I was in the abusive relationship, I, I was completely isolated and I didn't talk to anyone about it, whether I was having trouble with everything that was going on, or I was just having a day where I was depressed or anxious or anything. I just wouldn't talk to anyone really, except for my best friend in Toronto. And, um, she knew a little bit of what, what was going on, but I was very guarded and I didn't tell her a lot of things, but we kind of ironically and tragically, but also it's been really helpful. She was going through a really similar thing. Um, in her life with an abusive partner as well. And so we both had this unspoken rule that it was like, you're going to have to get to a place on your own where you see this. Mm -hmm. I might see that this is an unhealthy relationship, but I can't force you to see that. You're going to have to walk. It's the same thing as someone that's dealing with an addiction Mm -hmm. until they want to change things. You can scream at them and encourage them and whatever, but until they reach a place where they want to change, you're never going to get through to them. And it's the same thing with an abusive relationship or even like uh, someone dealing with really bad depression or really bad anxiety until they reach a place where they want to change things, you can't do anything. And so we had kind of this unspoken rule where it was like, I understand that you, that you care about this person and that you can't see everything right now. So I'm just going to, I'm going to listen and I'm going to be there for you when you need me. I'm going to like stay within your circle 
and just be there for when you need me until it reaches a point where I'm concerned for your safety. Mm. And so it reached that point where she kind of was a little bit tougher on me, but I was already so far down and hitting my own rock bottom that having her say that made it, made me feel like, okay, I can, I can do this. Like I've got someone who knows a little bit about what's going on and she's concerned for my safety. I'm not crazy. Um, but I can do this. I have the support. And so I think the biggest thing is just, uh, I have another friend who we lost touch over the course of that relationship, but she, when I called her after and kind of told her what was going on and everything, she said to me, and this is like my favorite thing. She's like, I knew something was going on, uh, but I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to help you. So I just stayed in your orbit. Mm. And I knew at some point you, I knew you would figure it out and you would reach out. And I just stayed, stayed in your orbit until you were ready. And that's really all you can do. Check on them. Um, let them know that you're there for them. They can talk to you, that they're not alone. And unfortunate. And then, yeah, if, if their safety is on the line, for sure intervene. But um, really all you can do is stay within their orbit and just be there for them and let them know that they're, they're loved and they're wanted and they're, and you can encourage them, but that's really, unfortunately all you can do. And it's so hard to watch someone go through that. I mean, like my mom had to watch all of this unfold from far away and knew that it wasn't okay and knew there was other stuff going on, but there was nothing she could do. And she knew that. So some of it's, not being judgmental on the, uh, like your mom's side, just being there to listen. And I think some of it is, and that's really hard for a lot of people. I know a lot of people are like, no, I'm going to tell them how it is. And I'm telling yeah. you, those are the people that are going to be pushed off because you, you have to get there on your own. Yeah. It's, there's a, a big hole, whether you're in depression or whether you're in an anxiety attack or you have to crawl out. And I know there, uh, I don't know who wrote it. I did not, but it was like, I think it was a song, you know, that all I can do is get down in that hole with you. That's yeah. it. I can't get you out. I can't pull you. You have to get yourself out. And I think that what that means for the person who's dealing with it is accepting what they're saying as truth to them. Totally. And, yeah. and then I think you can also say, you know, you can remind them who they are that you know them to be. Mm -hmm. You are strong. You yeah. are super creative. You, and I think sometimes we need that. Um, we, uh, I think next week we'll talk to Lenny and I think when he's gone through things, you know, he just said, you know, text me, you yeah. know, and I, sometimes you don't know what to say. You just say, Hey buddy, I love you. Right. Yeah. And I think that that's where the orbit comes in. And there yeah, are people, exactly. and, but this is so critical. And I don't know if we, as creatives suffer from this more, I don't know if it's because we're empathetic and we take things on. I know my friend, T Tara, it is hard because like her name really is Tara. <laughs> Me and you yeah. have talked about this. I don't want you to think I'm talking about you because your name is Tara. I got it. <clears throat> but she would always make fun of me because I would go to a movie, any movie. I mean, even a Google commercial makes me cry. You know, like I'm super empathetic and I just, take it on. She's like, are you going to wear your slicker? You know, like I have to get my <laughs> rain jacket to go to the, oh my gosh. um, I don't really get my rain jacket, but I do cry a lot at movies, but I think that, but I don't really cry a lot in real life. So it's like, that's an outlet for me. And I think, right. but I know that she loves me and she's just making fun, not in a bad way, but I think she knows when to make fun and when not to make oh, fun. Oh, totally. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So I there's, that go ahead. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I think the other thing that they can do is to educate themselves, um, right? So whether it's a, you're dealing with someone who's in an abusive relationship, someone who's going through depression, someone who's going through anxiety, even if you don't understand exactly what they're going through, educate yourself because saying nothing is the worst thing you can do. Hmm. Of course, there's times where you'll say the wrong thing. We're human, right? Right. But the best way is like to educate yourself of what they're going through or what they might be going through so that you can try to maybe say the right thing and say what they need to hear. And the other thing is like, especially when it comes to abuse, there are things that 
play with psychological abuse that you might not be aware of, like something like a trauma bond or mm. um, things like that, which um, a lot of times is the reason why people c- keep returning to abusive mm. relationships. And if you're not aware of that, then you you might just get frustrated with the person and be like, you keep going back to this relationship, you keep complaining about it and you're not taking my advice. Like what's wrong with you? And it's like, it's literally like a trauma bond is, they compare it to being addicted to heroin because it's, it's consistent. So when you're in an abusive relationship, there's highs where the, the abuser is, you know, saying the right thing, doing, being really nice. There's love bombing and all of this stuff. And then you go into the low where they're being abusive, they're being violent, they're being whatever the case and you're craving the high. And so the minute that you separate from them, you're still craving that high. It might not be that you necessarily miss that person, but it's really easy to fall out of love with someone, but it's nearly impossible to fall out of bond with someone. Mm. And if you're not aware that that's happening to you or other people aren't aware that that's happening to you, then they just get frustrated and they're like, what's wrong with you? Or like people said to me, you know, how did you stay in that for that long? And it's like, cause I didn't know, like my reality was being completely shifted and I didn't know what was going on. And so I think if, the people around you can't get you out of that situation or pull you out of the hole or whatever. The best thing that they can do is just educate themselves as to what you might be going through and offer like little, like my friend would, I would come to her with a problem. She'd be like, Hey, I I think that you might be being gaslit. And then I didn't know what that meant. So I looked it up and you know, I ended up putting the pieces together, but had I not had her putting those things in my ear in a really encouraging and, and kind way, I would have, like, I'd probably still be in it. I don't know what gaslit is either. So gaslighting is, um, basically, again, I'm not a psychologist. So my, right, right. this is all, this is all just stuff that I've learned. Oh, We're not lawyers either, people. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. No one sue us. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, So gaslighting is um, when the abuser convinces you of a reality that's not Mm. real. So it can be things like, um, you know, you're having an argument with them and they're like, well, they just make something up and like, no, I said, I apologized for that already. And you're like, no, you didn't. Right. Or did you? And when you're so far in with, Mm. with an abusive, in, in the abuse cycle, you start to question your own reality and then it becomes like, well, did you do that? Or did you say that? Or, you know, yeah. So it, it, uh, there, they just put, right. Amy said manipulate manipulate someone by psychological means into questioning their own sanity. So totally get that. So this can happen in, and, and it's not like the abuser is like sitting in the corner. Oh, how, how can I be abusive? No. Like some abusers don't even know they're abusing, right? Yeah. Um, it's different than drugs, right? But it's still a high for them and a, it's a control thing. So Absolutely. It's, it's, they're not these evil people. I think that they just, I know somebody who has had sexual trauma and I don't think that the person who did the trauma was, you know, th- that was what was done to them. And so they thought it was yeah. normal. And so normal. Absolutely. So it is not like you're just walking around and anybody in a whatever t-shirt, those people are abusers. You can't pick them out. They can't even pick themselves out, but this is where it's just like, um, they say addicts when they're in treatment are not supposed to date each other. Um, right. But that's what's happened is you have two, in a way, you have the abuser and then the person who is willing to be abused or, or is so, uh, they're not willing to be abused. Like you're super strong, but it's like, maybe you thought you could help that. You know, it's like, we, we think we can save them to some extent, whether that's a client, whether that's a a family member, anybody, right? Yeah. But it's it's really understanding your what you are in control of and what they are in control of, and understanding where those things, where those lines are. Um, Absolutely. So therapy has really helped you. 
I think yes. you've, you've done talk therapy. I've done talk therapy. I don't know. Isn't that what it's called? Talk therapy? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. But you also <laughs> really, and I've done group therapy too. I've done like intensive group workshops that are like amazing. And mm -hmm. I didn't realize I was so afraid of rejection. That was one of my big things. So then for me, um, somebody who rejects me and this is something even as a teacher i've really had to deal with i had to make a conscious effort i'm going to be their coach they might not like me and i'm going to have right. to be okay with that and i'm i mean like i know you people think people like me but i don't <laughs> think all my students like me i mean some of them definitely i don't see like, that being Ooh. possible but okay <laughs> or i need to have a talk with them <laughs> but i think i'm their coach and i've decided to be that hard kind of like you need to get this done. I am loving to them, but it is in a, it's in a different way than I am in this community, I think. But, um, but like you, you have tried another kind of therapy that was really interesting. We talked about this summer. I don't know if you mm -hmm. want to talk about it at all, but sure. I had never yeah. heard about, and just because one therapy didn't worked for you in the past, it's just like medicine, you know, certain medicines. I used to be on Zoloft and then I tried it again and I was like, this stuff is not working for me, you know? Totally. <laughs> your body changes and I also think what is going to help you changes as well so it can't be like oh I'm just going to go back to my same therapist and they'll be able to heal me again this time and For a sure. lot of abuse has to do with PTSD as well right mm -hmm. you're you're dealing with this is not made up this is a real thing um and this happens kids ha have this and then they grow up into adults and they have PTSD to some extent as well right so all right, I'm going to stop talking. You tell us some things. <laughs> um, well, one of the things I wanted to add to what we were speaking about before, like the, those cycles and like, uh, you know, kind of trying to find those people that are, may, might be abusive versus you trying to save like that kind of stuff. There's two articles in the resource page, or sorry, there's a video and an article in the resource page that are amazing um, in explaining that. So one is, um, there's the toxic cycle between empath and narcissist. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times, because as an empath, you want to help people, you want to listen to their emotions and narcissists seek out those people because they can put their emotions on you and make you try to fix them. And you'll do it because you want to help people and you're empathetic right. and you see them hurting or whatever the case. Um, so that's a really great one. And then there's also a um, video that talks about the abuse cycle and it talks about actually um from the perspective of like if you were to go to church counseling for that mm -hmm. and there's there's a little bit of a flaw with some church counseling when it comes Absolutely. to dealing with abuse cycles and so it, it it's just amazing how it explains um the cycle of abuse so those are really good at understanding more and maybe understanding even and it can be applied to friendships it can be applied to like you said client relationships parent relationships like all that kind of stuff and so the other thing that's at play is our patterns that mm -hmm. we develop at a really really early age so one of my patterns was um to try to fix people and what number kid are you what what number kid are you oh i'm the youngest of how many three or and there's, I, I have a brother and sister. Okay. Yeah. There's three of us. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't make um, me do math. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's three minus one. <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, so, um, I developed patterns and I can see them now as an adult and having gone through this and all of this stuff, but I developed patterns that affected my relationships, that affected friendships, that affected my romantic relationships. Um, even to some extent, my work relationships. And so as I've been able to start recognizing those things, um, it's been really helpful to heal them and change them. But the funny thing about changing patterns is it's very anxiety inducing because the patterns are familiar pain. It's pain that we know. It's mm -hmm. pain that we know is not going to kill us. But when mm -hmm. you step out of those, it becomes very anxiety inducing because it's, it's the unknown, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, so EMDR therapy is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. Um, and basically what it is, is it helps a lot in dealing with trauma. It helps a lot in dealing with um, 
uh, PTSD. It helps with also with anxiety. Um, so this, again, I'm, I'm just explaining my experience with it and what my therapist explained to me and how it works. Um, but basically it helps to, so as, as time progresses, we can, and, and there's more distance between a traumatic event or something that was really painful. It becomes less, we become less emotional when we speak about it. We, we feel less emotional when we think about it, that kind of thing, but that takes time. And so EMDR tries to speed that up and cause you to be not like numb or anything like that, but it causes you to be kind of like on the other side of these emotional things. And one of my favorite ways to explain it, um, not that everyone's going to go and teach about it, but it's even just when it comes to talking about our struggles and all of those things. Um, a woman who I admire so much, her name is Nicole Moline. She used to be a Peloton instructor and now she does amazing um, work around she does like retreats and and stuff all that kind of stuff around joy and um, mm. connection and community she said to me um, teach from your scars not from your wounds Ooh. and so that's one of the best ways that I've had this explained is it kind of makes these wound scars a little bit quicker <laughs> um, and it helps you process through traumas and anxieties. And the best part about it for me is that we have everything that we need inside of ourselves to heal ourselves, but there's noise around us. There's self-doubt, there's anxieties, there's limiting beliefs, there's patterns. There's all of these things that cause too much noise that we can't quiet things down and go, this is exactly what I need to heal these things or time, right? You and yeah. I have talked about this. Like you come out of something, you still have to go to work. You still yeah. have to get clients. You still, I yeah. mean, you have your own business to be able, this is how I just think you're so strong because you were able to keep clients, keep working when you didn't feel like it. And I feel like that with moms, you know, like I'm not a mom, but I feel like that or dads, I guess, you know, not trying to cut anybody out of the court page here but <laughs> but I feel like you know there's there are those uh, I don't know I just there's never a day that my mom doesn't have to figure out what she's gonna cook for dinner or something you know there's yeah. no not a day that my dad's gonna be like you know I'm gonna make dinner not that my dad doesn't ever make anything but you know he's never gonna change the sheets on the bed or clean the toilet probably you know like I mean, I I love my dad, so don't think my dad's terrible. But you know, like I don't think my mom ever gets a break. Like I right. got her a D bot for Christmas, so hopefully she she called him Wayne because mine's named Bruce. So, uh, so hopefully that'll help her a little bit. But yeah. do you know what I mean? Like there's yeah. never a day off. And if you have pets, you have pets. You have mm -hmm. dogs, right? Yeah, I have two dogs. Yeah, and you can't be like, you know what? Today you guys are gonna have to get yourself out, right? Yeah. <laughs> get your own food <laughs> right go to the bathroom yeah. outside figure out how to open up yeah. the door right yeah yeah so keeping going is really difficult this isn't like you can go like with addiction people are uh oh they're gonna go to rehab or something and that's this time away and some people can have time away and they can go to a retreat or go something like this but a lot of us are just normal working people and we don't have time for that. We have to yeah. keep going to work. So how did you continue stepping every day into the shower, into the whatever, right? Yeah. Um, it was really hard. It was honestly, it, it was, it was really hard because I, I came home and I couldn't just stop. Um, I had to pay my bills. I had to, uh, take care of my dogs. As you said, I had to, you know, it was just me and I was living on my own. Um, and then working on my own as well. And so, uh, I think for a lot of it, I was kind of in, I was kind of running on adrenaline. I was still very much in shock as to what had happened. Um, and it took me a while to actually feel ready to go to therapy and talk mm -hmm. about these things because I was like, you know what, I'm just going to have to like, I have to put a cork on this because I can't, I can't deal with it uh, right now because like, I don't have the capacity because I have to get this stuff done. 
and it was really, really challenging. Um, I made a lot of mistakes. I disappointed a lot of people. I, mm. but I also had a lot of triumphs and I also got a lot of work done, but creating under trauma is really, really hard. Um, I wouldn't wish it on anyone, but the thing is like little things that you can do to try to mitigate that. Um, and like one of my friends in, um, Atlanta, she, um, oh, she was a godsend to me. Um, during that time, she spent like two hours on the phone with me a few nights, uh, when I first moved back just to kind of help me through it because she had been through something really similar. And she gave me this kind of list of advice. Um, and then my therapist at the time, um, prior to me leaving Atlanta also gave me a bunch of advice. So one of the, a few of the things that she kind of said was just like lay low mm -hmm. for like six to 12 months. Like, and I, at first I was like, that sucks. I want to like, yeah. I'm, I'm, you know, healing. I'm, I'm back. Like I want to talk about it. And I, like, I immediately wanted to jump into like mm -hmm. building you are the wolf and, and helping other people. Cause I was like, my story isn't unique. Like I am like, I, I want to get out there. I want to help people. And I tried like writing some posts and I ran them by my friends. And one of my best friends, Raji King actually gave me some of the best advice. He was like, Hey, um, this is great. <laughs> like he read one of my posts and he's like, this is great. <laughs> and I'm not going to tell you what to do, but the goal, if the goal is to try to help people, this is still very toxic and it's very much about the abuser and mm. not about like, you're not on the other side yet. Like you need to give yourself more than a month. <laughs> It was still a wound, not a scar. Exactly. Exactly. Mm. And he said to me, you're trying to help other people from drowning while you're literally in the water drowning yourself. And I was like, damn it. <laughs> but that's a pattern, right? That's a pattern it, it is. for us. It is. Yeah. Absolutely. Be like, you know what? I'm fine. I can deal with this later. There's other people I need to help. And so that was an awesome reality check. And then my other friend, you know, she kind of said, lay low. Um, like it's, it's kind of a season of, of stillness. Um, she said, mm. only say yes to the projects that like enough projects to make ends meet kind of thing. And don't say yes to the projects that are too hard, mm. um, that, you know, and just know, like, she was like, you're gonna, you might disappoint some people right now. Um, and she said to like, you're going to feel like a burden right now, but those are really good feelings to face. Mm -hmm. Um, and then she just encouraged me to like, to dream, right. Cause when you're in an abusive relationship, it's just, you're like, it's like tunnel vision. Like you can't see a future. You can't see mm -hmm. tomorrow. Everything just feels so muddy and awful. And she just kind of gave me a lot of hope and that like, like start dreaming again, like start a Tara 2.0 Pinterest board and, um, or do like a vision board or, and all that kind of stuff and journal. And then she gave me a lot of books that help. So obviously I, I couldn't shut my business down and just do that, which I would have loved to have been able to do. Um, but the important thing is that like healing is a journey. It's not, there's no timeline. Everyone's process is different it doesn't look like crying for, it doesn't always look like crying for an hours on end and then you're magically healed or, you know, big weepy sobby therapy sessions. And then you walk out feeling better. Like that's not how it works. It's very much like, it's not linear at all. And you just have to kind of listen to your body and what it needs. And you just have to realize like, this isn't forever. It's just a season. Right. And so for me, I, I did have to push down a lot of stuff in order to survive. And I was very much, um, I was very much still running on adrenaline. Um, and then really only, uh, at the end, like mid last year in August, things started to kind of slow down. Um, I moved to a different place, um, in a new relationship and, it was only then that I really started processing things and um, 
like healing a lot of these wounds and acknowledging like, oh, I do have PTSD like really bad. <laughs> and so that's kind of where I'm at right now, to be honest, is I'm working through, through that stuff and having to work through that stuff and still have to work is really hard. Um, but what I find helpful is just doing like little things here and there, like, um, journaling or reading and setting yourself a time, like mm. I'm going to do 10 minutes of reading this book today, or I'm going to do 30 minutes of journaling. Like you can do 30 minutes of journaling. Um, and you've been painting, you've been drawing, you've yeah. kind of fed into some of those things that maybe you had turned off for a little bit. Yeah. The other big thing you did was you started really exercising and doing CrossFit. Yeah. Like, I mean, talk about going full in like CrossFit, <laughs> but it really helped you, right? Yeah. No, it, it, I started, it's been almost a year that I've been doing it now. And, um, the, the gym that I go to, cause I was so intimidated. I was like, there's all the stereotypes and, and all of that stuff. And it can be very intimidating. And you think that you are going to get judged if you can't lift a certain amount of weight or something like that. Um, but I just decided to try and, um, it has just completely changed my life. The community, the, um, the, my favorite part about CrossFit, because the place that I go to, uh, the owner is very much, um, into like learning the mechanics of the movement mm. and then being able to do it consistently and then ramp up intensity. So everything is scaled. It's not like you walk in and if you can't do a pull up, you're out. Like, <laughs> right. <laughs> so you scale it accordingly, but then you see your growth. And for me, it, mm. it like being able to, you know, grow physically and mentally because exercise is such a mental game mm -hmm. way more than it is physical and with crossfit you know you see the workout on the board and you're like there's no way that i can do that in that time like y'all are crazy and then you do it and you you do it in less time or you do it more weight than you thought you were going to and you you do it and you realize just how strong you are and you're literally proving yourself mm. how strong you actually are and that has been insanely helpful. And then there's all like, you know, releasing endorphins right. and all of those things that you get from it. And then the community, which has been really, really amazing because you meet people that have similar mindset and they, they are all just trying to uplift you and encourage you. And, and I would encourage anyone, like it might not be CrossFit, it might not be yoga, it might not be cycling, whatever, just find the thing that works for you. And that you enjoy because otherwise you're forcing yourself to exercise and you don't want to, and it's not fun. Right. <laughs> All right. So we're almost at the end. We got 10 minutes. I want, you've shared this. I've shared this link a bunch, but I'm going to go ahead and say it just in case somebody's driving and they want to write it down. Please don't text it to yourself, but it is in this <laughs> link underneath, but it's you are the wolf.com slash resources. And then everybody can sign up at you are the wolf.com. Yep. Okay. So, so is there something that you've learned or are learning that has helped you see your strength? Because I think you, one of your superpowers is boldness, boldness of sharing, boldness of vulnerability. But I also, um, I, you haven't been afraid to kind of fail, like even go into CrossFit, like I'm not going to be able to do that, you know, but then you <laughs> surprise yourself. So it's bold. And I think a lot of people don't, they're really afraid to take some of those steps. So, uh, and just trying new therapies and, and talking to different people about different things and just trying some things is, is bold. That's a great superpower you have. So anything that has helped, because I think sometimes in abusive relationships, um, no matter what kind they are, client or uh, parent or uh, sibling, friend, <coughs> partner, um, that strength seems to be depleted. We mm -hmm. feel less strong. So what are some things that you've found that really help you see your strength? Um, leaving the abusive relationship mm. was, that was one of the hardest and scariest things I've ever had to do. Um, but I actually think it's the complete opposite. I think that we're at our weakest at the start of the relationship. We mm -hmm. don't see the red flags. We trust mm -hmm. things or make excuses or whatever the case. And then it's 
like building muscle. So when you build muscle, when you weight lift, you are depleting, like you're tearing your muscles and then they grow back stronger every single time. Mm -hmm. And I see abusive relationships as a bunch of tiny cuts and those tiny cuts make you stronger to the point where you get to, you can see clearly, you Mm. can see the abuse, you can see the manipulation, you can see what's happening. And then you, you have to be at your strongest to walk away because it takes so much courage. It takes so much strength. Um, it's terrifying. And so I think that it's actually the opposite. I think you're at your strongest when you leave because they've, they've built all of these tiny cuts and you've started to build a resistance to it. And you start to see like, I'm not going to tolerate this. I'm better than this. I deserve better than this. And then as you're healing, it takes a while to go from shame to being proud of yourself. And that took me a while. Um, but yeah, that's, that's one of the greatest lessons of how strong I actually am that I've had in my life so far. And Doc says, for what it's worth, he's proud of you. Why are actually, you going to make me cry, Doc? Why are you going to make me cry like that? I, I love that. I love that it's the flipped. It's that you really are the strongest as you leave. That is so awesome. Okay, so how do you recharge? Um, like we said, CrossFit, um, uh, yoga, reading, um, snowboarding, longboarding, that kind of stuff. And then one of the things for me that I've started doing to fight burnout or like when I don't feel like working because I'm dealing with something else or whatever, is I decided to do 10 minutes of something that I actually want to do. So whether that's painting, whether sometimes it's folding the laundry, (laughs) but I want to do it. Right. So you give yourself that like little boost and encouragement. Um, so that's one of the things that I've started doing and, and it's really been helpful. That's cool. And doc says you can come on over to Charlotte and fold his laundry. (laughs) Um, um, so what about what inspires you? Has what has through all of this, I think you've talked about some people that have really inspired you. Um, has some of that changed? Like what used to inspire you is different or is it still the same kind of stuff inspires you? Um, I think the biggest thing that inspires me is other people's stories Hmm. because it not only allows connection, which is inspiring in and of itself, but it allows you to see like, you're not alone in things. You're not, you know, other people go through hard things. Um, and other people inspire me and like the things that they've been through, the things that they've, they've triumphed over. And then also just how they see the world. Like, Mm -hmm. I just think it's, it's really inspiring. I think story is one of the most inspiring things. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So what advice would you give your younger self? And at what age would you give it? Oh man. I was like the most, (laughs) I was like the most emo um, high school kid. I'm still am. Who am I kidding? But I would probably say that it's going to be okay. Hmm. That's good. All right. So then what's next? I know you have an art show coming some, right? So you're building body of work. When is this art show? It's on February 27th. Um, it's uh, here in Calgary at a uh, restaurant. And so it's a collaborative, collaborative event with um, uh, two artists here in Calgary. Um, and then also a musician and two really well-known chefs. And so we're putting on this event um, over a meal with cocktail pairings. It's going to be a four course meal with cocktail pairings. And then I've curated the art and then I'm doing some interactive pieces and then the art will stay there for, um, a little while afterwards. So if you don't make it to the event, you can go see the art and you guys are all welcome to come visit me in Canada and come see it. Yeah. (laughs) That's awesome. Yeah. (laughs) All right. So February 27th, is that what you said? Yes. Okay. Yes. And yes, Lenny road trip, get your butt over here. (laughs) So, so that's one of the next things. What, um, is there a plan for when you are the wolf? Like, I know you're working on the art thing, um, for the show. So when is is there a release or, or just, we should keep checking the resources page. Um, 
Well, I'll, I'll announce it on, if you sign up for the email list, I'll be announcing it then. I will um, be creating some products um, for the art show as well to be Great. sold then. So depending on how, how many and how, how things go, then they'll be up online to be purchased. Cool. Um, and then you can follow along on Instagram, which is the main the place where I post, you know, resources and quotes and things that help and stuff like that. Um, yeah. All right. So I'm going to share this stuff. So this okay. is all of your everything. Um, so the, you are, <laughs> it's uh, Instagram.com obviously. So, and then you are the wolf co co. Yes. And then yeah. also you can check out her design work and her illustration at hatch and Harbor H A R B O U R. Demi would probably spell it right. Cause he's in the UK, but all of us would not spell harbor that same way <laughs> and then you are tara victoria it's a super easy uh dot com tara t-a-r-a and then on pretty much everywhere it's tara victoria with an l yeah that's victorial correct. i guess or just First victoria last name. l yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. um and then Dribble and Twitter and and you're pretty active on there. Um, we so, try to be. <laughs> yeah. So so those and you you are definitely there for people. You want to give people hope. Absolutely. And, and I definitely hope that people will go to youarethewolf.com and sign up um, to get on the newsletter, and then we'll see what all the stuff she's creating and and doing and. It's just always good to talk to you and you're really yeah. inspiring to me. And I appreciate you starting off the mental health month and it's a I'm really so powerful honored. story. Thank wow. you. I'm so honored to be here finally. I know. <laughs> yay. And it, she does lettering. She does everything. You guys are just, um, uh, I hope that you guys will check it out and I hope that you'll be there for somebody else if they're in that situation. So Tara, I can't thank you enough. And look, we're actually going to end on time, people. Oh my gosh, yay. <laughs> can't believe it. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. And we'll see you next week. Next week, we're talking to Lenny Terenzi. And it's a mental health month the whole month. So it's about self-care. And there's a lot of uh, correlations. He's He's been in here today. So I know that there's going to be a lot of um, overlap probably, but it's from a different perspective. And I hope that um, people will tune back in. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Come join it and, and listen to Lenny because he's amazing. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll see you guys next week. That was a great episode. I'm super thankful that you guys listened all the way to the end. So just so you know, you can, again, always join us live. It makes it so much better and you definitely feel like part of the family. Leave a review. You can share it with your friends. One of the best ways to support the channel and the podcast is to leave a review on iTunes or Google Play or wherever you get your podcast on Spotify or whatever. Um, you can subscribe to the channel, leave a comment on an episode that you watch, and of course, share it with your friends. You can become a patron. You can support the channel and the podcast or, but for even just a dollar a month. Each level of support has extra benefits and rewards that are delivered to patrons only. And you can do that at patreon.com slash Diane Gibbs. And my favorite way to build websites is with the Elementor plugin, making almost any WordPress theme invincible. This plugin has changed the way I've been able to design websites. It's also really increased my speed um, at doing them. And it has a ton of different there's a free version and then the paid version. You can choose the plan that's right for you. Bitly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash capital D, capital R, Elementor, E-L-E-M-E-N-T-O-R. I hope you guys will join me next week and um, hit like and subscribe. And I can't wait to see you. Hopefully I'll see you live.